Hey guys, it's Hannah and this is Bookworms Talk and today I'm going to continue in my series of reading my subscribers favorite books. A couple of these I have read and I will have reviews listed down below. I'll have like a notation somewhere on the screen so you know which one is which. And as always, I will have timestamps in the description of which books I read at what time so you can skip if you have read it. So today I'm going to be reading A Little Life, Thoughtless, and Bridge of Clay. First I'm going to start off with A Little Life. The 11th apartment had only one closet but it did have a sliding glass door that opened into a small balcony from which he could see a man sitting across the way, outdoors in only a t-shirt and shorts, even though it was October, smoking. Willem held up a hand in greeting to him, but the man didn't wave back. In the bedroom, Jude was accordioning the closet door, opening and shutting it when Willem came in. There's only one closet, he said. That's okay, Willem said. I have nothing to put in it anyway. Neither do I. They smiled at each other, the agent from the building wandering in after them. We'll take it, Jude told her. But back at the agent's office, they were told they couldn't rent the apartment after all. Why not? Jude asked her. You don't make enough to cover six months' rent, and you don't have anything in savings, said the agent, suddenly terse. She had checked their credit and their bank accounts, and had at last realized that there was something amiss about the two men in their twenties who were not a couple, and yet were trying to rent a one-bedroom apartment on a dull but still expensive stretch of 25th Street. Do you have anyone who can sign as a guarantor? A boss? Parents? Our parents are dead, said Willem swiftly. The agent sighed. Then I suggest you lower your expectations. No one who manages a well-run building is going to rent to candidates with your financial profile. And then she stood, with an air of finality, and looked pointedly at the door. When they told J.B. and Malcolm this, however, they made it into a comedy. The apartment floor became tattooed with mouse droppings, and the man across the way had almost exposed himself. The agent was upset because she had been flirting with Willem and he hadn't reciprocated. Who wants to live on 25th Street in second anyway? asked JB. They were at the Faux Viet Hyung in Chinatown, where they met once a month for dinner. Faux Viet Hyung wasn't very good. The pho was actually sugary, the lime juice soapy, and at least one of them got sick after every meal. But they kept coming, both out of habit and necessity. You could get a bowl of soup and a sandwich at Faux Viet Hyung for $5, or you could get an entree which were eight to ten dollars, but much larger, so you could save half of it for the next day or for a snack later that night. Only Malcolm never ate the whole of his entree and never saved the other half either, and when he was finished eating, he put his plate in the center of the table so Willem and JB, who were always hungry, could eat the rest. Of course, we don't want to live at 25th and 2nd JB, said Willem patiently, but we don't really have a choice. We don't have any money, remember? I don't understand. Why don't you just stay where you are?" said Malcolm, who was now pushing his mushrooms and tofu. He always ordered the same dish. Oyster mushrooms and braised tofu and a, te and a treacly brown sauce around his plate as Willem and JB eyed it. Well, I can't, said Willem, remember? He had to have explained this to Malcolm a dozen times in the last three months. Merritt's boyfriend's moving in and I have to move out. But why do you have to move out? Because it's Merritt's name on the lease, Malcolm, said JB. Oh, Malcolm said. He was quiet. He forgot what he considered inconsequential details, and he also never seemed to mind when people grew impatient for him, with him for forgetting. Right. He moved the mushrooms to the center of the table. But you, Jude, I can't stay at your place forever, Malcolm. Your parents are going to kill me at some point. My parents love you. That's nice of you to say, but they won't if I don't move out, and soon. I like the way it flows. From a writing standpoint, I'm into it. I already bought this book. Spoiler alert. So I will eventually read it. I heard it's gonna absolutely tear your heart out. I'm sorry that I'm not giving summaries with these, but these are kind of popular books. Maybe I will on the less popular ones. I feel like everyone knows about this one already. Next, I'm going to read Thoughtless by S.C. Stevens. This is one I read back in like 2013. It was hugely popular and I do a review for it. And I actually reread it not that long ago, so I could still stand by the review that I said. Very love triangle-y. Honestly, there's a lot of content warnings with a couple of the books, so maybe check those out if that's something that concerns you. So chapter one, meetings. It was the longest drive I had ever been on. That really wasn't saying a whole lot since I had never driven more than 60 miles away from my hometown. Still, by anyone's standards, the drive was absurdly long. According to MapQuest, it was 37 hours and 11 minutes long. I'm assuming that's if you're superhuman and never pit stop, of course. My boyfriend and I were driving away from Athens, Ohio. I had been born and raised there, along with every member of my family. It was never discussed among our little foursome, but it was a known from birth fact that my sister and I would be attending and graduating Ohio University. Therefore, it had been a terrible family tragedy when, a few months ago, during my second year there, I made plans to transfer out in the fall. What had shocked them even more, if that were possible, 
was the fact that I was transferring nearly 2,500 miles away in Washington, more specifically, the University of Washington in Seattle. I had landed a pretty nice scholarship, though, and that had definitely helped to sway my parents. Helped, but only a little. Family gatherings were going to be colorful from now on. The reason for my transfer was sitting beside me, driving us away in a beat-up Honda. I looked over at him and smiled. Denny Harris. He was beautiful. I know it's not the manliest way to describe a guy, but in my head, it was the adjective I used most often, and it seemed to fit him to a T. He was originally from a small town in Queensland, Australia, and a lifetime spent in the water at that exotic locale had him tanned and muscular, but not in a beefy kind of way. No, more in a natural proportion, athletic way. He wasn't overly tall for a guy, but he was taller than me, even when I wore heels, and that was enough. His hair was dark, dark brown and he liked to have it slightly styled into chunky but orderly pieces. I loved to do this for him, and he adoringly let me, sighing and complaining the whole while that he was just going to shave it off one day. He loved it, though. His eyes were warm and a deep, dark brown, and they were currently turned in my direction to sparkle at me. Hey, babe, not too much longer now, maybe a couple of hours. The way his accent slid over the words was curiously intoxicating to me. It never ceased to bring me some small sliver of joy, as weird as that was. Luckily for me, Denny had an aunt who, three years ago, had been offered a position at Ohio University and moved over here. Denny, being the sweetheart that he was, had decided to come over with her and help her get settled. Having loved being in the States for a year back in high school, it didn't take him long to decide to transfer to Ohio U, which to my parents, up until he had swept me away, that is, made him the ideal candidate for my affections. I sighed and hoped they got over this college thing quickly. Thinking I was sighing at his statement, Denny added, I know you're tired, Kira. It'll just be a minute at Pete's, and then we can go home and crash. I nodded and closed my eyes. Pete's was apparently the name of a popular bar where our new roommate, Helen Kyle, was a local rock star. Though we were heading off to be his new permanent house guests, I didn't know much about him. I knew that while his junior year in high school abroad, Denny had stayed with Kellen and his parents, and I knew that Kellen played in a band. Yep, I knew the whole two facts about our new mysterious roomie. I opened my eyes and stared out the window, watching the thick green trees blur past me. The numerous street lamps on the freeway cast an odd orange glow upon them, and finally made it to the last mountain pass. I had been worried for a moment there that Denny's old car wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to make it. We were currently zigzagging past lush forests, rocky waterfalls, and vast lakes sparkling in the moonlight. Even in the dark of night, I could tell it was beautiful here. I could already see a new life opening up for me in this picturesque state. This is like so full of tropes. I mean, not that that's a bad thing, but really the writing is what makes it enjoyable. Like, it's like a trope done well. That's my best description. You can find out more if you want to check it out. Um, I'll have it linked down below, my full review. Next, I'm going to read Bridge of Clay by Marcus Zuzak. In the beginning, there was one murderer, one mule, and one boy. But this isn't the beginning. It's before it. It's me, and I'm Matthew. And here I am, in the kitchen, in the night, the old river mouth of light, and I'm punching and punching away. The house is quiet around me, as it is, everyone else is asleep. I'm at the kitchen table. It's me and the typewriter. Me and the old T.W., as our long-lost father said, our long-lost grandmother used to say. Actually, she called it the old T.W., but such quirks have never been me. Me? I'm known for bruises and level-headedness, for height and muscle and blasphemy, and the occasional sentimentality. If you're like most people, you'll wonder if I'd bother stringing a sentence together, let alone know anything about epics or the Greeks. Sometimes it's good to be underestimated that way, but even better when someone sees it. In my case, I was lucky. For me, there was Claudia Kirkby. There was a boy and a son and a brother. Yes, always for us there was a brother, and he was the one. The one amongst us five who took all of it on his shoulder. As ever, he told me quietly and deliberately, and of course, he was on the money. There was an old typewriter buried in the old backyard of an old backyard of a town, and I'd had to get my measurements right, or I'd dig up a dead dog or a snake instead, which I did on both counts. I figured if the dog was there and the snake was there, the typewriter couldn't be far. It was perfect, pirateless treasure. I'd driven out the day after my wedding day, right from the city, right through the night, out through some reams of empty space and then some. The town itself was a hard, distant story land. You could see it from afar, and there was all the straw-like landscape and marathons of sky or- Oh my god, marathons of sky! This, I'm loving the writing. Around it, a wilderness of low scrub and gum trees stood close by, and it was true. It was so damn true. 
the people sloped and slouched. This world had worn them down. It was outside the bank, next to one of many pubs, that an old woman told me the way. She was the uprightest woman in town. Go left on Turnstall Street, right, then straight for, say, 200 meters, and then left again. She was brown-haired, well-dressed, in jeans and boots, plain red shirt, and eyes shut tight to the sun. The only thing betraying her was the inverse tangle of skin. There at the base of her neck, it was tired and old and crisscrossed, like the handle of a leather chest. You got it, then? Got it. What number are you looking for, anyway? 23. Oh, you're after the old Murchisons, are you? Well, to tell you the truth, not really. The woman came closer, and I noted the teeth of her now, how they were white and gleaming but yellow, a lot like the swaggering sun. As she approached, I held my hand out, and there was she and I and her teeth in town. My name's Matthew, I said, and the woman, she was Daphne. By the time I was at the car again, she'd come back from the money machine at the bank. She'd even left her card behind and stood there now, with a hand at center hip. I was halfway into the driver's side and Daphne nodded and knew. She knew near to almost everything, like a woman reading the news. Matthew Dunbar. She'd said it. She didn't ask. There I was, twelve hours from home, in a town I'd never set foot in in all my twenty-one years, and they'd all somehow been expecting me. I'm really, really enjoying the writing of that. I've heard amazing things from this author and the style of writing that he has, and it's, it's really unexpected. Like, the sentence structure is jarring, but not in a bad way. I'm into it. I'm really liking that. So if there are books that are favorites of yours that not enough people have read and you want me to read and you want others to read, comment those down below so I can include them in my next video. Please subscribe if you did enjoy it and you want to see more along with other book reviews that I post as often as I can. I do post a little bit more frequently with smaller book reviews on Instagram if you'd like to follow me there. I'm uh, just at Hannah's stories, two S's, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.